our Father, our Father, our Father which art in heaven, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the power and the glory and the glory forever forever in jesus name we pray in jesus name we pray amen, amen. i will sing the mercies of the of the lord forever with my mouth i will make known thy faithfulness to all generations for i have said mercy shall be built up forever thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens i have made a covenant with my children i have sworn unto david my servant Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. They lie. That was for the reading of uh, Psalms 89, verses 1 through 4. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and doing of his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome, everyone, to Bible Christians, Fellowship of the Spirit. I'm running a little bit late. Let me get my cell phone shut off. It'll be a reminder for everyone to shut their down if you don't mind. So, so. If I can get it to do what it needs to do here, it doesn't want to work. It'll ring off the hook, though, won't it? <laughs> All right. Happy Sabbath! Happy Sabbath. Yeah. <clears throat> and happy High Holy Day, Jay Holman. A day that I stand on what my pastor says about this day. Last time I heard a lesson, he said he was in the Word 30 some odd years and he's fasted exactly 30 some odd years once a year on the Day of Atonement. I cannot take this. I, I surely do get afflicted. I do. I mean, I get afflicted. And when I look at something during the year and, and I think that I might have to resort to fasting, I get grieved. But then again, I'll freak myself out by midnight knowing the Day of Atonement is 365 days away. That's how bad I get when I fast. And to top it off, I'm not doing too well today. I was up most of the night with a stomach virus. So I'm going to get through this lesson, though. There was uh, some doubt that I might even make it here today, but the Lord has given me a second win. So the title of this first lesson for the Sabbath lesson is Holy Convocation. And for those that are joining us online, welcome, happy Sabbath, happy Day of Atonement. Because even though I get afflicted on this day, this is a day to rejoice. The Day of Atonement. It's a day to rejoice, sisters and brothers. Push that headache to the side, let the stomach nausea go, whatever, the hunger pains and all that. We should be rejoicing this day. This is one of the Lord's feast days, the Day of Atonement. This is one of the Lord's feast days, the Sabbath day. There's great joy for being here today. For being amongst brethren, for praising God that he's given us knowledge and wisdom and understanding. To be able to keep these things. So the first lesson is a weekly Sabbath lesson is going to be just entitled Holy Convocation. What we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to show you what a Holy Convocation is. Fifteen times in scripture the Lord commands one. Fifteen times Holy Convocation is mentioned in scripture. It's alluded to in other times where Jesus and Paul and all of them went to the Sabbath, to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Holy Convocation is alluded to. Paul taught one Sunday, the whole day he was breaking down the word. When he's breaking down the word, we're going to show you that was a Holy Convocation. But the Lord commands it on certain days, and this is one of them. But what constitutes a Holy Convocation? I have heard so much about what a Holy Convocation is. I've heard more than my fair share of knowing what I've heard about what a holy convocation is. Holy convocation can only happen on the Sabbath and on the holy days. Holy convocation can only be where the pastor says the Lord's name. Holy convocation, I mean, fill in the blanks. I've heard some foolishness. I've heard some foolishness by some brothers that have some understanding. Let's let the scriptures break it down. Let's do what the Lord said and rightly divide. And let's see exactly what a holy convocation is. A lot of people don't know the difference between a congregation and a convocation. There is a difference between a congregation of people 
and a holy convocation, a gathering of people. So what we're going to do is we're just going to run it down. We're going to break down some scriptures. We're going to read those 15 times in scriptures where the Lord commands a holy convocation. Then we're going to make the point clear with some helpful definitions at the end. We have some printed out on this lesson page, some uh, some definitions, and on the website there are some some. There's a 13 page breakdown of nothing but definitions, no interpretations involved. It's just definitions of everything pertaining to a holy convocation. So you can go and you can look at that, and you can come to your own conclusion in your mind of what a holy convocation. Because we've heard a lot. When you've been in the Word for a little while, you've heard a lot about what a holy convocation is. The only thing is, a lot of what we heard is in error, not according to the Word. Let's just break it down with the book. Let's start this out in Matthew, the 18th chapter. First scripture of the day, first scripture by those that hold to the point that you have to have a holy convocation where your pastor says the Lord's name. This is the first scripture that they contend with, saying, no, that's not talking about what it's talking about. Let's just read it. Let's start this off in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew 18, and we're going to start this off in verse 20. Matthew 18. Now, right before this, the Lord is talking about what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loose in heaven. He's talking about brethren gathering together, rightly dividing to keep the church intact, the true church. Not the Bible, Christian fellowship, the spirit of the Israel of God, or any of the other classes around the nation. The true church. The church that started in the wilderness. The church that the whole reason for the existence of the church is to make the covenant with the people. And when you take hold of that covenant, you now become the church. It's that simple. It's not about where you gather. It's not about who your pastor is. It's not about what day of the week you gather. We know it is about what day of the week you gather to keep the covenant. But it's not about what day of the week you gather to keep a holy convocation. It's about how you conduct yourself in the true church being a living example of God's grace and mercy to others. Matthew, the 18th chapter, and we'll start this off in verse 20, brother. 18 and 20, go ahead. But where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I, the mystery. I, the mystery of them. So now, if I tell a brother that I'm going to have a holy convocation on the Sabbath day, and I'm gathering with four other brothers, the first thing they're going to tell me is, well, where are you going? What class are you going to? Oh, we're going to my living room. Oh, that's not a holy convocation. Well, the Lord says... When two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, that's not what that verse means. Well, somebody, please, I've asked them, tell me what that verse means then. What does it mean when the Lord says, when two or, or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them? How can you twist that? You can't. The Lord says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When you're having a holy convocation on the Sabbath day, two or three are gathered in his name. That's what makes it holy. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. What makes it a convocation holy is gathering in the name of Jesus and rightly dividing his word. If you could have, I mean, there's convocations. Businesses have convocations. Businesses have convocations. Football teams have convocations. They're gathering for their team meeting. You could call it a convocation. Is it holy? No. They're not gathering in the name of Jesus to break out the Bible. They're gathering to break out X's and O's and offense and defense and how they're prepared for the next opponent. But that's a convocation. It's a gathering together. It's an assembly, a calling together of people. And we'll cover that in a minute. So, the first point we need to make about a holy convocation is where two or three are gathered together in my name, the master says, there am I in the midst of them. Let's go look at this again. Let's go to Malachi, the third chapter. Malachi, the third chapter. Malachi, the third chapter. I was just talking about this verse with a brother the other day. Malachi 3. And with these scriptures, rather. Malachi 3, and let's pick it up, brother, in verse 16. 3 and verse 16. Go ahead. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. They that feared the Lord. Take off in one another. When this says fear the Lord, that tells me these are servants or saints. These aren't just people that are gathering together 
to talk about, yeah, well, if Jesus ain't really the one, that's not the ones that are gathered together that the Lord is saying here. They that feared the Lord spake often one to another. It's talking about us that fear him and keep his commandments. Go ahead, brother. And the Lord hearkened. And the Lord hearkened. Go ahead. And heard it. So he was listening and he heard it. Go ahead. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, that thought, that thought upon his name. This is talking about the book of life. The book of life that is seated right now somewhere up in the heavens. Hopefully with our names in it. Because when we gather today and the Lord is in the midst of us here, He's putting our names in a book. He's putting our names in a book of remembrance that's written before him for them that feared the Lord and fought upon his name. Go ahead, brother. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Is the people gathering tomorrow that are not keeping this high holy day today? <coughs> Is the Lord going to remember them? Are they going to be his? If they're going to be his, then we're doing something wrong, sisters and brothers. Because we're doing everything that the Lord says to do in his word. We're gathering on the, the Sabbath days and the feast days. We're trying to the best of our ability to be loving and kind and patient and tolerant. I know, right? That's hard to do sometimes. That's the hard stuff. To set the tree up and not go to church on Sunday and all that traditions of men. That's, that's not hard. The hard stuff is the daily walk. The way we treat each other. Guilty all day long. Sometimes I tell you, I gotta go in the other room and break down and sob before my God for the way I treat my children sometimes when they get under my skin. Part of having a family. Sometimes when I have words with my wife and I go in the other room, it grieves me because I can't in that moment take a step back. Because I got God on my mind 24-7. I'm guarding my heart to the best of my ability 24 7. I'm on my knees every morning. I'm reading the book every morning. I'm on my knees every night. And when I fall short, it eats at me right where my wallet sits. It eats at me. It tears me up. If it doesn't tear you up when you fall short, you better look in the mirror a little bit longer. That's hating, even hating yourself, like the Lord says in other scriptures. If you don't hate mother and father, sister, brother, daughter, I'm paraphrasing uncle, aunt, cousin, even yourself, more than me, you cannot be my disciple. When you fall short, you should be beating the heck out of yourself. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Go ahead, brother. And that day, when I wake, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as man spares his own son that serve him, uh -huh. then shall he return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So those that serve God, that fear him and keep his commandments, and that gather in his name, and that are speaking about him and calling on his name. The Lord's got a book that he wrote, and it's the, it's the uh, book of life. The Lord here calls it a book of remembrance, and your name is in that book. And your that book right now is seated with the Father and the Son. Somewhere up in the third heaven. Right now, keeping this holy convocation, your names, the Lord is putting it in this book. And if it's not in the book, I don't know, maybe he's putting a, a one tally or a star or whatever the Lord's doing next to your name. But it's because you're gathering on this day. It's because you're keeping his feast days, his dietary law, his statutes and commandments and his judgments. Let's continue. Let's go to 1 Timothy, the third chapter. 1 Timothy, the third chapter. We just got a few scriptures we're going to set uh, set up the rest of the lesson with. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, and let's pick it up at first, verse 14, brother. 3 and 14. Go ahead. <coughs> These things write I unto you, I unto thee. Those who come unto thee shortly. Uh huh. But if I tarry long. Now Paul says, These things I'm writing unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I wait long, go ahead. That thou mayest know. How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. But if I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of God. 
In other words, how you're supposed to behave yourself, how you're supposed to conduct yourself. I'm writing these epistles unto you so that you can learn how to conduct yourself, and I'll be there shortly. But if I wait a long time before I come, I'm sending you these letters so you know how you're supposed to conduct yourself as the church of God. And notice how Paul writes this. He says, the pillar and the ground of truth, the church of the living God, the great God of Israel. Go ahead, brother. 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of the Bible. Uh -huh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, in the world received, received up into glory. And Paul, in verse 16, he lets them know that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he just breaks down the gospel of Jesus Christ and his coming kingdom. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. All in a nutshell, in one scripture. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came to save us, to suffer and die, and to go up into heaven, to be raised again and go up into heaven, and at the appointed time, come back and judge mankind according to the word that he brought us. But it's about how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul writes all these letters to teach all these other churches how they're supposed to act. Let's continue. Let's go to Hebrews 10 chapter. This is not going to be a real long lesson. I'm not going to turn this into a two, two hour lesson set today. If I start going too long, somebody can say something. I won't go too long. I don't have no scriptures. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Well, you guys must be hungry, man. I'm not even getting a laugh out of this crowd. <laughs> Hebrews 10. And let's pick it up at verse 22. Hebrews 10 and verse 22. It's a good thing you are hungry because we're going to feed you this spiritual food. 10 and 22. Go ahead, brother. Let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh -huh. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Go ahead, brother. For he is faithful that promise. Uh -huh. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Uh -huh. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some has been exhorting one another. It's one of the, yes, it's commanded. God commands us together, but God doesn't just command us together because he wants to see us all in the room opening up his word. He commands us to have a holy convocation so that we can exhort each other. We can consider one another and provoke unto love and to good works. We come together and we are strengthened in God's word and in fellowship for the rest of the week. And then those of you that are in God's word, and have been in God's word for a while, and you've had made relationships through holy convocations like this on the Sabbath day, and this great day, the Day of Atonement, and the other feast days and everything, now you start to have relationships with other brethren and other sisters that are in the word. And now you can reach out during the week when something's troubling you. You can reach out during the week when you're going through trials and tribulations. There are very few people that I'm even in contact with that aren't in God's word. Family members included. I do my very best not to deal with other people's drama because I got enough of it in my house. I got two cousins when I moved back into the Chicago land area back in the early 90s, took me in and they were like my, my natural brother. I had two, bro two, two cousins that are males and one that's a female live in the same house. They're closer to me than brothers and sisters, than my natural brother and sister, excuse me, and sister. When I came back in 92 to Chicago, I lived in one, my one cousin's basement for about eight years. And I mean, we fellowshiped and everything we did, we ran together. He was just like my natural brother. I can count on one hand, just since I've been married seven years, and how many times I've even talked to him. 
tried to share a little book with him. He didn't want to do that. He's out there drinking and drugging and fornicating and doing the, the worldly stuff. What am I going to tell him? What is there that I can possibly share with this brother? The Lord said, don't fellowship with darkness. What am I going to share with him? He's not going to change his ways. He knows where I'm at. What am I going to possibly share with him? What good can come out of me hanging out with him? Can two walk together unless they agree? These are some of the choices when you come into the word that you have to make. Not saying turn your back on your family, but you got responsibilities now. You got the word of God. It's just like a husband and wife. When they come together and they're doing all these wonderful things and they're going out and taking trips and all this stuff. And all of a sudden they come back for the doctor saying you're pregnant. Guess what? Not about you anymore. It's about the children now. You come into the word of God and you start becoming a servant. Not about you anymore. It's about carrying this word. It's about pleasing our master. It's about pleasing our God. And I don't care who it is. And I crossed the bridge before with family. With the immediate family. So I can say this from experience. I don't care who it is. If they come contrary to the word of God, you're best to leave them be. I'm not going to tell you not to call them or anything else. I'm just going to put it straight on the line with you. you best to leave them be and walk the other way. They need help. If it's legitimate, give them a hand. They're clamoring and everything else. Let them hit their bottom. Because a lot of times, I know if it wasn't for me hitting my so-called bottom, I wouldn't be standing here today. Everybody keep picking me up, patting me on the head, telling me, oh, don't worry, it'll change. Everything will be all right. Hand me money and everything else. I'm never going to come right? But now I'm getting off track. Let's go to Proverbs, the 27th chapter. Proverbs 27. We're talking about the holy convocation and the gathering together of brethren and sisters, right? Proverbs, the 27th chapter. Proverbs 27. I thought Brother Devin was maybe going to throw a book or something at me. Come on, man, let's go. Proverbs 27 and verse 9. Let's get a speed up here real quick. 27 and 9. Go ahead, Lord. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So does atonement, though. It rejoices my heart now that I'm not sick and I'm up here standing before you. I am grateful to be standing here fasting. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. Go ahead, brother. So does the sweetness of a man's friend by heart counsel. So, so does the sweetness of a man's friend by heart counsel. You get that at a holy convocation. I get that anytime I want to. I pick up my phone. If I hit the wrong number in my address book by mistake, I'm going to get a brother or sister. Either that or I'm going to get a client and they're going to be like, who, who? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong number. I'm going to go up one. Watch, brother Doug. Down one. Brother Deontay. Up a few. Brother Ed. Whatever. Okay, but this is what you get on a holy convocation. You get that sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You get that hearty counsel. That sweetness, man. That's like the ointment and perfume. You know how it is when you walk into a club or something, or or, or even a grocery store, and you smell that perfume that you just like for whatever reason. And you're like, oh man, that smells good, right? Or when a man's wearing a cologne and you smell that certain scent for you ladies, for you sisters. That you really like, that particular scent, Old Spice or Jovan or whatever it might be. Oh, that smells good. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. But so does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Skip down to verse uh, 17 and continue. There we go. I see some people aren't hungry. 17, brother, go ahead. Man sharp with the countenance of his, of his friend. Read 17 one more time, brother. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You get this in a holy convocation. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. These are some of the reasons to have a holy convocation. The Lord just didn't command it just because he wanted to see us all in one room. There's a reason behind fellowship. It keeps you grounded. It keeps you humble. It keeps you from getting puffed up. From thinking you're something when you're not. You come together, you stay grounded. You gather with people. There is no feeling in the world like keeping a Sabbath day. There just isn't. I don't have to work. I don't have to cook, clean, and all the other stuff. 
Of course, the kids don't like it because now, you know, they got those restrictions that they don't have the rest of the time. But they'll grow into fear in God and keep his commandments. We pray. But this is the reason for the holy convocation, the fellowship, the gathering together of brethren and sisters. Let's continue. Let's go to Psalm 133rd chapter. Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Psalm 133. And brother, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. 133 and verse 1. Go ahead. Behold. How good and how pleasant it is for a brethren to dwell together in unity. And it is good and it is pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. One day we're all going to be neighbors, hopefully. But one day we're all going to be gods. But one day, hopefully, we will all be neighbors and we'll be rejoicing in the Lord. I don't want to look over and see any of you in the fire. I don't want to look over and see anybody in the fire. I wish that that was the most desolate pool that I've ever come across. But unfortunately, it's not going to be that. <clears throat> how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Go ahead, brother. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the deer. Even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirt of his garment. Precious ointment. It is like precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. That anointing oil that the Lord had Aaron anointed his high priest. How special that oil was. We're going to go ahead and anoint him, the high priest. And when they put it on his head and it ran down and it's running down his beard, it's a precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. That's how precious it, is, precious it is for us to keep a holy convocation together. Go ahead, brother. That the dew of Hermon, Hermon, and the dew of descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded, <coughs> commanded the blessing, even for a little, even life forevermore. Let's continue. These are some of the reasons. We're going to go to Acts, the 16th chapter. These are some of the reasons why we keep a holy convocation. We've already learned one important thing about a holy convocation. It's only got to be two or three people. I understand sometimes how some of these other churches and other classes, they want to pound the fact that you've got to be here, you've got to be sitting here with us. Because they understand how important it is to keep a holy convocation. But, that being said, there's nothing wrong if you're sitting at home with two or three people and you're breaking out the book on a Sabbath day. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a holy convocation. We'll get to the definitions in a minute. Let's see some of the places where we can actually gather, where they gathered in God's word to keep holy convocations. Let's go to Acts, the 16th chapter. We're going to read one verse, verse 13. Acts 16, one verse, brother, verse 13. Go ahead. And on the Sabbath we went out to the city by a riverside where prayer was to be made uh -huh. and we and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. On the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. In other words, where they would go to pray. There was no synagogue in a town. I don't know how many of you have looked at the history of biblical times. If there was no synagogue in a town or the synagogue was too small for all the town people they had designated areas where they would go to keep a holy convocation because it was commanded. They would go down by the riverside. They would go down by the river. This served two purposes, especially when the weather was nice, not like today. If somebody came in to see him, what you were teaching and they wanted to get baptized, you put them right in the water and you baptize them. You make sure they understand what they're getting into. They make the covenant, you can baptize them right there on the spot. And it's a predisposed meeting place where people know I can go down by the river and I can get together with believers. I can go down by the river and I can gather with people that fear God and keep his commandments. So you have people by the river keeping a holy convocation on the Sabbath. Let's go to Romans, the 16th chapter. Romans, the 16th chapter. And I know I'm going to get some phone calls out of this person. Yeah. Praise God in Jesus' name. Romans, the 16th chapter. And we're going to read one verse. 16 and verse 5, brother. When you get there, go ahead. 
Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved. Empatius, who is the first fruits of Actia unto Christ. Uh -huh. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. You got people that on the Sabbath day are having people come over to their house to keep a holy convocation and rightly divide God's word. See, a lot of brothers, they don't you don't look at the history, a lot of sisters, if you don't look at the history and you don't look at the customs and the biblical times, you lose sight on what's going on. It helps make the scriptures come alive. It's just like they gave Papa a seat over there in this room, upper room, they say, where Jesus kept the Last Supper. This room's got gold ornaments and all kinds of designs and stuff on the ceiling, and a man of Jesus' stature would not be allowed to go near this room. This was for all the well-to-do people, this particular room, for all the rich and well-to-do people would fellowship in a room like this. When Jesus kept the Passover, more than likely, it was in an area where they had one room, adobe-type huts, and then they had stairs that would go up the side of the house to what they called the upper room. And for feast days and when they would have parties and things like that, they would go ahead and they would put, I don't know if they used bamboo, but they would put like tree limbs and stuff like that to keep the sun and keep the rain off. And they would go ahead and they would decorate the roof of the room. More than likely, that's where the master kept the Passover. If you don't look at the customs and the history, just read the book. You'll get salvation, but if you're not taking a look at everything, maybe you shouldn't be teaching everything you think you know. Maybe you should take a step back and do some research. Because that's what we do. We take a step back and we research things. I'm not going to teach anything up here that isn't straight truth. There's a lot of things I throw over with other brothers. There's a lot of things I'm convicted of that I throw over with other brothers. But because it's not absolute, I'm not going to teach it. But you better research what you teach. Go to 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. 1 Corinthians 16. One verse, brother, verse 19. Go ahead. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. With the church that is in their house. The church, again, being those that take hold of the covenant, not are gathered to a particular building or a particular denomination. You take hold of that covenant, the great God of Israel becomes your God and you become his people. You are now part of the church. The church that is in their house. Let's go to Philemon, the first chapter. I'm going to pick it up here a little bit so we can get through this. Philemon, the first chapter. We're going to read one verse, brother. We're going to read verse 2. Philemon 1 and verse 2. Go ahead. And to our beloved Sophia, uh, Archippus, our fellow soldier and to the church in thy house. And to the church that is in their house. Now, let's go look at all the places God commanded us to keep a holy convocation. If you find more than these, by all means, please let me know. I did this on a Bible concordance search more than once. We're going to start this off in Exodus 12. And we're just going to, well, I hate to say run through these, but we're going to move through these pretty quick. These are the 15 places that the Lord commanded a holy convocation. Exodus 12. One verse, brother, verse 16. 12 and 16. <coughs> Go ahead. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. And no matter of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. In the first day there should be a holy convocation, and the seventh day there should be a holy convocation. This is talking about unleavened bread. Let's go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. That's where we'll find most of them. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. First three, brother. 23 and 3. Go ahead, brother. 
six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, an holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwelling. The Sabbath day. Go ahead in verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. And we do proclaim these in their seasons. We do a holy convocation as commanded every Sabbath day, every seventh day, which is today Saturday, which has not changed since the creation. And that's been proven. Then we do this on all the Lord's feast days. On all what we call high holy days. Skip down to verse 7 and continue. And the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Go ahead to verse 8, brother. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is the holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Talking about unleavened bread. Skip down to 21 and continue. And you shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. This shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout your generation. Now there's a little sentence in here. Let's talk about Pentecost. It's a little sentence in here that a lot of people don't pay attention to. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings. The Lord only sets his name in one place, Jerusalem. It's the only place the Lord is going to set his name, Zion. That's where he desires to dwell. That's going to be his habitation. That's where he sets his name. It says three times a year, all people for the feast days have to go up to Jerusalem. That's where the Lord don't set his name anywhere else. But in all our dwellings, that's where we should keep these feasts. This is where wherever you live is where you keep the Sabbath and where you keep the feast. You don't have to run up to Jerusalem. Only one place the Lord sets his name, Jerusalem. He's not setting it there right now. So now in all your dwellings, wherever you live, you find other brothers and sisters and you gather together with them and keep a holy convocation. Does it say where? No. Doesn't even say how. Some things the Lord figures we got to have a little bit of understanding of. When you got people and you gather together and you read his word, it's a holy convocation. It's a heart about this. Skip down to 24 and continue, brother. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month and the first day of the month, so you have a Sabbath, a memorial of one of the trumpets, and holy convocation. And we are going to be doing this commandment next Thursday. Skip to 27 and continue. Also, the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. This shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your soul and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. I'm sorry, I, that was trumpets. I'm getting ahead of myself thinking that was tabernacles. We'll be doing tabernacles next Thursday. We already did trumpets. Some of you kind of looked at me a little funny as I continued reading. I saw why. Skip down to 35 and continue. I'm not feeling really good with that. It's got nothing to do with the fasting. Go ahead, brother. 35. On the first day shall be an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. This will be us next Thursday. 36, go ahead, brother. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn, solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. Now I heard one brother in a lesson try to say that a holy convocation was a solemn assembly. It's not. A solemn assembly is a solemn assembly, and a holy convocation is a holy convocation. A funeral is a solemn assembly. Not every funeral is a holy convocation. Some funerals can be holy convocations, but it's not one that the Lord commanded. Let's go to Numbers, the 28th chapter. Numbers, the 28th chapter. Numbers 28. Numbers 28. And brother, we're going to start this in verse 18 when you get there. Go ahead. Keep reaching for my water. In the first day shall be an holy convocation. You shall, you shall do no matter of servile work therein. Skip down to 25 and continue, brother. And on the seventh day you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Skip to 25 and continue. I'm sorry, 26. Also in that, also in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord after your weeks. Be out, you shall have an holy convocation. 
you shall do no servile work. Skip down to the twenty chapter twenty nine and read verse one. They several they several tenth deal unto the lamb. Twenty twenty nine and verse one. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing of the trumpet unto you. Get down to verse 7 and continue, brother. And ye shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month an holy convocation. And ye shall afflict your soul, and ye shall do any work therein. But ye shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord for a sweet Savior, one young bullock, one round. I'm sorry, skip down to 12 and continue. And on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work, and you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. Yes, sir. Okay, now, that's it for the scriptures for today, for this particular part of the holy convocation. But let's look at some helpful definitions before we close this lesson out. Okay? On your sheet should be some helpful definitions. Holy convocation. Let's see what holy means. Brother, this is out of Webster's 1828 Dictionary. What's the definition of holy? A meaning of a religious character as distinguished from... Hang on, brother. I don't know what you got here. It's right at the bottom of the lesson. It's on the first page first of the lesson. There no, right here. Oh, hallow, consecrated, or set apart to a sacred use, or to the service or worship of God. A sense frequent in scripture as the holy Sabbath, holy oil, holy vessel, a holy nation, the holy temple, a holy priesthood. So what makes the, con the convocation, what makes it holy? It's dedicated to the service and worship of our God. Simple, right? What's convocation mean? Out of the Smith Bible Dictionary, and this is just a snippet. If you go to um, if you go to the uh, website, keep wanting to say Facebook page, or maybe it is a Facebook page. The website, there's a 13 pages of definitions. Again, it's nothing but definitions. I'm not going to keep using the excuse I don't feel good. Let's just get old, get this through this here. Go ahead, convocation, brother. They call them together. Assembly. Which one are you reading, brother? Right here, convocation. Got a Smith Bible dictionary. This time with one exception. Does apply variably to meanings of the religious character and contradiction to congregation. And it's in contradistinction to congregation. So convocation, this term with one exception, Isaiah 1 and 13, is applied invariably to meanings of a religious character in contradistinction to congregation. I don't know what that word means, so I had to look it up. What does contradistinction mean, brother? First, Merriam-Webster. Distinction by contrasting or opposing quality. Uh-huh. A distinction drawn on the basis of contrast, sculpture, and contradistinction to painting. Now, that wasn't real clear to me, so I got it one other place, the online free dictionary. What is contradistinction in that definition? A description between things as different as distinct. A discrimination between things as different and distinct. Go ahead. It is necessary to make a distinction between love and infatuation. So it's necessary to make a distinction between love and infatuation. Infatuation, you got to crush. Love, you just can't live without the person. You're going to make them their wife or your husband, whatever. The distinction. So, going back to convocation. It is applied invariably to meetings of a religious character in contradistinction to congregation. Contradistinction is a distinction be between contrast and repulsive qualities. You got a congregation and you got a convocation. Two different things. If you got a congregation gathers together, that's a meeting of a congregation. It could be a holy convocation, but it's not one and the same thing. It's two different things. Two different things. I heard that I have to set where a pastor sets the name of the Lord, so I have to be in a church building to keep a holy convocation. That is not true. That is an erroneous statement. 
A convocation is the same but different than congregation. It's a totally different animal, a holy convocation, or a convocation, a gathering together of people. It's different than congregation. Let's look at the convocation again, this time out of King James Dictionary. Combo, combo, convulsion. Right here, King James Dictionary. Right here. Oh, a calling together, assembly. So a convocation is a calling together or assembly. What makes it holy is when you call people together to assemble in the name of our Lord. Now it's a holy convocation. Now read that uh, next convocation, this one here. Don't even worry with all this in the scripture. Just read uh, whatever pertains to the definition. Holy convocation, but in the word is sometimes used alone. And on a holy convocation, no work can be done. The phrase differs from solemn assembly. The phrase differs from solemn assembly. So a holy convocation is not a solemn assembly as commanded on the eighth day of tabernacles. It's, a, it's an eighth day of tabernacles. When you hold a holy convocation, you are having a solemn assembly. But a solemn assembly is not a holy convocation. I want to make that clear. Go ahead, brother. Which is the Pentiach? Pentiach is only applied okay. to, the, to the concluding of festivals at the end of Passover and Tabernacles, while holy convocation is used for the Sabbath and all great holy days of the Mosaic legislation. Legislation. Go ahead and skip down to the next definition of convocation. And this is Webster's 1828 again. Go ahead. The act of calling or assembly by a summons, an assembly, a meeting of a meeting of religious character as distinguished from congregation, which is more general, dealing with political and legal matters. Hence, it is called a holy convocation. Such convocations were the Sabbaths, the Passover, annual day, the feast of tabernacles, the feast of trumpets, Pentecost. The great fasting fast of the annual day of atonement was the holy convocation. Uh -huh. We'll write in the Smith Bible Dictionary of Congregation, and I think I'm going to I'm going to end it on this. Um, this is uh, Smith Bible Dictionary Congregation. Go ahead, brother. Should be the next definition. Congregation. This describes the Hebrew people in its collective collective capacity. Uh huh. Under its peculiar aspect of a holy, a holy community held together by religious rather than political bound, bond. Sometimes it is used in a broad sense as inclusive or foreign settlers, but more properly as exclusive, appropriate to the Hebrew element of the population. Uh -huh. The congregation was governed by the father or the or head of each family and tribe. Uh -huh. The number of these representatives being inconveniently large for ordinary business, a further selection was made by, by Moses of 70, who formed a species of standing committee. Occasionally, indeed, the whole body of people was assembled at the door of the tabernacle, hence usually called the tabernacle of the congregation, Numbers ten and three. The people were strictly bound bound by the acts of their representatives, even in the cases where they disapproved of them. So I'm going to end on that last definition, Smith Bible Dictionary, and this is why. Back in the wilderness, when Moses, when he went ahead, and um, his father-in-law said, "You take way too much on you, man. You need to get some other brothers, and you need to have them help you." Moses took seventy elders, set them up as tribes over the nation of Israel. Okay. So you had from there, you had captains over so many, captains over so many. In other words, you had kind of like the city of Chicago, where you got all these aldermen and precinct captains and all this, and then you got the mayor, and then it, it, it works its way all the way up. But you had different people taking care of different groups of people. In other words, they were like supervisors, and they were in charge. Okay, You had the same thing going on around Jerusalem. So you had whole neighborhoods. All doing the same thing, fearing God and keeping his commandments. Sabbath day came, everything shut down. Just like it used to be when some of us were younger, 
without giving away our age. When everything used to be closed on Sunday. Everything used to be shut down on Sunday. You couldn't get a candy bar. Then they started keeping the local pharmacy open till noon. So that if you had some illness, you could at least run in there and you can grab whatever you needed. Aspirin, cold and flu or whatever. But even that used to be shut down. Then slowly, I remember in my neighborhood, the first time the grocery store was open on Sunday. Boy, some of the older uh, men and women that my mother used to hang around, man, you thought that the world was coming to an end. Because they were all diehard Catholicism. All of them diehard Catholics. And those blue laws were in effect for Sunday. Picture that being the Sabbath day. Picture right now the Sabbath day. The entire village of Lansing completely shut down. Now everybody has to have a holy convocation. It's commanded, especially today, the day of atonement. It's the, the, the Lord's Sabbath day and the day of atonement. You have to have a holy convocation. How are you going to get this entire village of Lansing inside one building? The biggest, the biggest meeting hall in Lansing wouldn't handle all that. The biggest meeting hall in the city of Chicago won't handle all that. You think the temple in Jerusalem would handle all that? No. You had representatives would go to their representative, would go to their representative. You would have representatives would go to the synagogue or the temple. They would get the message. They would bring it home to the neighborhood. They would pass it on. They'd have their little meetings of captains or, or aldermen or whatever you want to call it. They would talk about what went down that day in synagogue or in temple. Then they would run and they would go and they would take it to their people. And then before you know it, you might have one guy standing on the street corner preaching to 100 people. And they were all getting the message that went down in the temple that day. <coughs> and every time that somebody was breaking down the message that went down in that temple that day, it was a holy convocation. Simple. Very simple. So I hope that what we made clear today is exactly how to keep a holy convocation. We know what a holy convocation is. It's meeting in the name of our Master, our Messiah, in the name of God the Father. It's meeting to worship Him, to praise Him, to learn about Him, to be edified by other believers, to fellowship with other brothers and sisters. This is so important. People don't see this today. Nothing wrong with staying home one Sabbath. Somebody's not feeling good or whatever. Nothing wrong with staying home on the Sabbath, breaking out the book, or now we got the internet. Click on the internet. You're keeping a holy convocation. It can the holy convocation can be done any day of the week. But it's commanded on certain days that the Lord says. And it has to be done according to the way the Lord says it do it. The weekly Sabbath, holy convocation. How many people do you have to have for a holy convocation? Doesn't have to be a congregation where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there in the midst of you. The Lord is not trying to trip us up. The Lord is not trying to make things too hard for us. And wherever you live, wherever you dwell, you got to keep these Sabbath days. You got to keep these holy congregations that the Lord puts down. It's indeed a blessing. To have the knowledge and the understanding that we have to be able to gather like this and to edify each other and to get the spiritual food. Let's not be stumbling blocks to other people out there that don't have this gift that we have. Let's go out there and teach them the right way. Let's go out there and be living examples to them. The word says what the word says, and God meant what he said when he had it written. Let's not twist it and turn it. With our own self, self, selfishness and our false pride. I've been in the Word so long, I'm supposed to have all the answers. No, you're not supposed to have all the answers. But the answer you're supposed to have, that means more than anything, more than sacrifice of the bulls or the goats, it's your conversation. The way you conduct yourself. The way you draw others when they've been drawn to you. The way you draw them into the congregation so they can get fed and they can get some understanding. And hopefully they can get right back to the tree life. So without going too much farther, I thank you for the opportunity to rightly divide God's word. And I hope that somebody got something from this stuff. <laughs> <coughs> Do you want us to actually close out?